Hi everyone, my name is Kelly Raffin and I am a diagnostic medical sonographer. I'm going to be discussing the detailed anatomical scan today. For the rest of the presentation, I'm going to turn off my camera so we can focus on the images, but thank you in advance for your time and attention. I have no disclosures. The objectives for this talk are to explore the images to be included in the standardized detailed anatomical scan, to enhance the understanding of rationale for each image requirement, to offer guidance on acquisition of certain anatomical landmarks, and to support sites that offer the detailed anatomical scan. So for this ultrasound, I find it can be very beneficial to have a systematic approach. So I always start with the same structures. And for me, that's the foundation. And that means the uh, maternal structure. So I'm going to look at the cervix, the placenta, and the myometrium. And from there, I'm going to be flexible. So dependent on fetal position, I will start with whatever structure is available to me. And I'm going to try and group those things together so that it makes sense. And I'm able to kind of tell a story of physiology and functionality while looking at the anatomy of the fetus. So let's dive in, let's get started. Okay, so the sagittal cervix. An image of the cervix in the sagittal plane should be acquired at the beginning of the exam with a fully distended maternal bladder. The landmarks for this image include a mid-sagittal view of the cervical canal in continuity with the vagina and the lower uterine segment. Calipers should be placed between the internal os and the external os. And the reason for this image is a measurement of less than three centimeters may indicate an increased risk for preterm delivery and should be presented to the attending physician. Any funneling, bulging membranes, or overlying placenta will be demonstrated in this image, so it's very useful. Moving on to the cervix to placenta measurement. Demonstrate a sagittal view of the internal os of the cervix and its relationship to the inferior edge of the placenta. Use color flow imaging to show that there are no fetal vessels overlying the internal os of the cervix. The reason for this is to prove that the placental tissue does not touch, overlie, or extend beyond the cervix. This would be placenta previa. A low-lying placenta, when the inferior edge is less than two centimeters from the internal os, will often resolve as the pregnancy progresses. This is due to the growth that occurs in the lower uterine segment, resulting in the placenta moving up and away. This is not the case with placenta previa. Placenta previa poses significant risk should the patient go into labor and the cervix dilate. This is a condition that must be followed up and managed by the physician. If on trans-abdominal ultrasound, the placenta appears to be low-lying or covering the cervix, then an endovaginal scan should be done to confirm or disprove. So um, this is using an endovaginal assessment of the placenta location, and the images are a mid-sagittal plane of the cervix with the inferior edge of the placenta clearly visible, always using that color flow imaging covering the inferior edge and the in internal os. And the reason, as discussed, is to diagnose or rule out placenta previa or vasa previa. Vasa previa is a dangerous complication that requires management by the care provider. And the endovaginal ultrasound um, is discussed in another presentation, so I'm going to leave it at that. Moving on to the sagittal and transverse placenta images. After completing a full sweep of the placenta in sagittal, take an indicative image in the same plane. This can be repeated in transverse. The reason for this is you are assessing the placental tissue for areas of calcification, infarcts, placental venous lakes, retroplacental hematomas, subchorionic hematomas, placental abruption, chorioangiomas, areas suspicious for AIP or abnormally invasive placenta, and anything else that is not consistent with a, the typical appearance of a healthy placenta. In doing the sweep and interrogation, you are also assessing the myometrium for any fibroids. Sagittal and transverse placental cord insertion. Documenting the position of the placental cord insertion in both the sagittal and transverse plane is very important. The reason for this is that due to the shape of the placenta, it is possible to be centrally located in one plane while simultaneously being marginal in the other. Marginal cord insertion is characterized by a measurement of less than two centimeters from the placental edge. It is imperative that a velamentous cord insertion is accurately identified and the appropriate next steps are followed. This will entail assessing the vessels to ensure that there is no vasa previa bio endovaginal exam and possibly monitoring growth of the fetus going forward to ensure that there is appropriate interval growth. 
So here are some examples of that placental CI in both sagittal and transverse with color flow imaging and without. Okay, so we're going to move into the fetal evaluation now. For today's presentation, we're going to start at the top and work our way down. So we're going to work in a logical order, but again, recognizing that in real life, this is a dynamic scan and we have to be opportunistic and flexible with what the fetus is doing and what their position allows us to interrogate. But for now, we're going to start with the fetal head. So the images to be included in the fetal head and intracranial assessment and interrogation are the biparietal diameter and head circumference, the CSP and fornix, cerebellum posterior fossa nuchal full thickness view, the choroid plexus view, and the lateral ventricle view. The fetal head at the level of the BPD and head circumference. So in a true axial plane of the fetal head, the biparietal diameter should be measured at the level of the thalamus, demonstrating midline folks and the CSP. This is discussed in another talk, so I won't get too into the method of measurement and I'll leave it a little bit more vague. This one image depicts a plethora of anatomical structures and features that must be evaluated for each fetus. So the reason um, is we are able to use this image to identify any abnormalities at this level. Appreciable are the skull shape and contour, the midline falcs, the lateral ventricles, the thalamus, the fornix of the CSP, the insular depth, the evaluation of the symmetry of intracranial structures, any third ventricle dilatation, and keeping an eye out for midline anechoic structures. And then we think about things like vein of Galen, arterious venous malformations, or cysts. Here we have an example of an abnormal skull shape. This was seen in a fetus with a significant neural tube defect. To achieve this image, you must tilt slightly from the true axial plane of the BPD to drop inferiorly at the posterior aspect of the fetal head into the cerebellum. At this level, you can evaluate the cerebellum, posterior fossa, and the nuchal fold. The calipers for the transverse cerebellar diameter are placed so as to demonstrate the maximal diameter of the hemispheres in the axial plane. In millimeters, this will be roughly equivalent to the gestational age, and this is an outer-to-outer -outer measurement. Next, the posterior fossa measurement is acquired by placing the calipers between the cerebellum and the internal surface of the occipital bone. Finally, the nuchal fold thickness is documented by placing calipers from the external surface of the occipital bone extending to the external or superficial aspect of the skin. The reason. So proper interrogation of the cerebellum can lead to detection of serious anomalies such as cerebellar hypoplasia or dysplasia, vermian hypoplasia, cerebellar hemorrhage, and others. The transcerebellar diameter should be roughly equivalent to the fetal gestational age, so keep your eye on this in your scan. The cisterna magna is located between the cerebellum and the dorsal surface of the medulla oblongata, and this is the space where cerebrospinal fluid produced in the ventricular system drains via the fourth ventricle. This is an area that allows insight into the functionality of this system and the structural components that contribute to the process. Think about the consequences of a neural tube defect, dandy walker malformation, delayed fenestration of Blake's pouch, i.e. a Blake's pouch cyst, mega cisterna magna, vermian hypoplasia or aplasia, etc. The normal measurement is less than 10 millimeters. Finally, the nuchal fold. This measurement can serve as a soft marker, one with the highest consequence in aneuploidy analysis, as it carries an increase in risk by a factor of 17 for trisomy 21. This is also an opportunity to assess for soft tissue edema, cystic hygroma, or occipital seal. The normal measurement is less than 6 millimeters. A bonus, keep your eyes peeled for the insular sulcus. You can see it indicated here with that purple arrow. This can be appreciated at the level of the BPD through the level of the cerebellum. Imaging the CSP and the fornix. It is important to evaluate the cavum septum pellucidum and that this has become an expectation for the detailed anatomical scan. This should be visualized at the level of the BPD although many times the BPD is measured including the columns of the fornix and not the actual CSP. You must prove an anechoic box to demonstrate a normal CSP. The reason, if it is not possible to prove the normal appearance of the CSP, one must consider the possibility of agenesis or partial agenesis of the corpus callosum or another neurological anomaly. 
A good rule of thumb to employ for quick assessment is that the AP of the CSP should be greater than the transverse diameter. Here we have an image of an abnormal CSP with a genesis of the corpus callosum. So this is that correlative image. Although this image is not specifically included in the TORS optimized practice outline of the anatomical scan, this is a valuable view and easily achievable in the same midline sagittal image used to evaluate the fetal profile. The reason, if there is suspicion regarding the normal appearance of the CSP, there must be consideration of agenesis or partial agenesis of the corpus callosum. So in that midline profile, we can see this beautiful corpus callosum outlined here. And then in our coronal view, we can see that hypocoque structure crossing midline showing that beautiful corpus callosum. So this is an image demonstrating a midline sagittal view of the profile and where we would normally be assessing that corpus callosum. We can see clearly that there's an absence of that normal appearance. Moving to the lateral ventricles, this image is acquired in an axial plane superior to the level of the BPD. Again, you should be able to demonstrate the midline falcs, fornix or CSP, part of the thalamus, and the lateral ventricle. The far field ventricle will be the most well seen, and efforts should be made to evaluate the contralateral ventricle when the fetus moves, or utilizing an oblique angle if necessary. When measuring the diameter of the lateral ventricle, use the parietal occipital fissure as a landmark to standardize this measurement. Measure from inner to inner and depicting the maximal distance. The parietal occipital fissures appear symmetrically as points extending laterally from the falcs and have a diamond appearance. You can see just here that's demonstrated. So the reason for this, this is where we should be assessing for ventricular megaly, intraventricular hemorrhage, periventricular hemorrhage, periventricular cysts or pseudocysts, heterotopia, and any calcifications. Calcifications may be signs that indicate an infection or other abnormality. And the normal measurement for that lateral ventricle is less than 10 millimeters. Here we can see an image depicting ventricular megaly. The choroid plexus. To obtain this image, you will sweep superiorly in the axial plane from the level of the BPD to the choroid plexus. This is a network of blood vessels that produces cerebrospinal fluid. The reason it is at this level where findings such as choroid plexus cysts, a soft marker, asymmetry of the choroid, a dangling choroid sign, and further appreciation of ventricular megaly may be achieved. Moving on to the fetal face. The images to be included in the fetal face assessment and interrogation are the mid-sagittal profile, the coronal face, orbits, and nose and lips. The profile. So in a true mid-sagittal plane, the fetal profile can be accurately evaluated. Appreciation of the forehead, nasal bone, tip of the nose, maxilla, mandible, and midline intracranial structures such as the corpus callosum, cerebellar vermis, and posterior fossa can be seen. Make every effort to assess the size and echogenicity of the nasal bone, i.e. is it more echogenic than the interface of the superficial skin surface overlaying the bone, by lining up the midline landmarks and then heel toeing to have the probe insinating at a perpendicular angle to the nasal bone. The reason for this image, when properly aligned and magnified, this image offers multiple areas of interrogation assessing the presence or absence of the nasal bone, assessing for prenasal edema, assessing how the mandible is situated and its relative size, thinking about retronathia, micrognathia, assessing the integrity of the maxilla for maxillary gap or defect, indicating a cleft palate, posterior fossa and cerebellar vermis abnormalities, such as uh, megacisterna magna, dandy walker malformation, neural tube defect with the obliteration of the cisterna magna, etc., and assessing the presence of the corpus callosum and its size, again thinking about agenesis or partial agenesis of the corpus callosum. Here we have an image of an abnormal profile demonstrating retrognathia. The inferior facial angle was only 31 degrees, less than 40 degrees is considered retrognathia. Another example of an abnormal profile, this fetus had a significant neural tube defect. 
And finally, this abnormal profile, we can appreciate an irregularity to the contour of the face. And this is a fetus with a cleft lip and palate. Moving into the coronal face, this image is obtained by twisting your probe 90 degrees from the plane of imaging for the fetal profile and sweeping superficially through the face. The reason for this, in this image you can assess for symmetry of the facial bones and orbits. You can assess the location of the mandible. With an abnormal mandible you're going to struggle to line up the face to include the chin. And remember to be aware of any superficial masses such as facial tumors or vascular anomalies. It is very good practice to sweep superficially and deep to appreciate the facial bones and the skin surface, so try and keep this in mind. The image of the nose and lips is achieved by sweeping superficially from the coronal face view. The reason for the image is to demonstrate the symmetry of the nostrils and an intact upper lip. So here we're thinking about a cleft lip and palate. Also, make note of the ability to simultaneously depict the tip of the nose and the lower lip and chin keeping in mind that an abnormality of the mandible, such as with retrognathia or micrognathia, will make it difficult, if not impossible, to do this. So here we have an example of um, a cleft lip demonstrating the utility of this nose and lips view in detection. Importantly, there is no obstruction around the face, there's no limbs in the way, and I know from my own experience that a lot of the time this can be a bit of a hindrance in proper diagnosis. So make sure you really work and are patient and wait for this view to be unobstructed and clear. From that coronal face, we can move into the orbits image. This is taken in an axial plane, slightly inferior to the level of the BPD. You will notice in the image peduncles midline and the posterior aspect of the midline falks. If you are in a true axial plane, the cerebellum will not be demonstrated. This image allows for subjective assessment of the orbital spacing, so thinking about hypertellurism or hypotellurism, and any measurements that might be needed, as well as the symmetry and situation of the orbits. One can also assess for the presence of two lenses and the shape and integrity of the orbit itself. Now we're going to move on to the fetal thorax. The images to be included in the thorax or cardiac assessment and interrogation are the M mode with fetal heart rate, four chamber heart, left ventricular outflow tract, right ventricular outflow tract, crossing outflows, intraventricular septum, situs, and diaphragm. The fetal heart rate should be quantified using an M mode tracing that intersects the atria and the ventricle. Ideally, or as a tip, the left atrial appendage is transected as it demonstrates the most variable movement and then also the ventricle wall. Pick two easily identifiable movement points like a valve closure or whatever makes sense to your eye, but pick a clear point. A normal fetal heart rate at this gestational age is between 120 and 180 beats per minute. But of course we know there's variability here, so it's very much dependent on fetal activity. During my scans, I always say if the baby's very active, it's as if you're going for a jog, your heart rate's going to go up, their heart rate goes up, or if they're settled, it's going to be a little bit lower, but we should see it in that normal range. The reason for this M mode is you can appreciate the expected movement and pattern of a heart in sinus rhythm, and conversely, any abnormality in the expected pattern. So be aware of any skipped beats, PVCs, tachycardia, or bradycardia. We begin with the four-chamber heart. The image of the four-chamber heart is imperative in any detailed anatomical scan and provides a huge amount of information. To acquire this image, move into a cross-section of the thorax at the level of the heart. For best visualization of the chambers, you can manipulate by heel or toe movements to point the heart up or down. The reason for this image. From this image, you may assess the overall size the axis of the heart, and look for any deviation or displacement. The heart should occupy approximately a third of the transverse thorax, sit midline and slightly to the left, and the axis, following the IVS, should be approximately 45 degrees left from a straight line if you drew that line from the vertebrae to the sternum. Assess the size and anatomy of the chambers. Look for discrepancies. Assess the morphology of the right and left chambers. Pay attention to the cardiac walls for any focal masses, such as rhabdomyomas. Look at the echogenicity. Look for dilatations, as in the case with aneurysms, etc. For the right heart specifically, look for the anatomical landmarks. 
we're looking for the moderator band in the apical aspect of the right ventricle and a slight apical displacement of the tricuspid valve. The right ventricle should be the most proximal to the chest wall of the fetus. And we can see it here with that red arrow. Evaluate the left side of the heart. Start by identifying the pulmonary veins that enter the left atria, and we can see here, and the ventricle that appears larger and apex forming. The four chamber heart view alone can detect up to 60% of congenital heart anomalies, including the outflows in this assessment increases the detection to approximately 80%. Be aware of the presence of a physiological amount of fluid in the pericardial sac. This is considered normal unless the amount is over three millimeters AP and it persists in M mode throughout diastole. So here we can see again this little line of fluid. In this plane of imaging, you will also be able to assess the symmetry and echogenicity of the pleural tissue and assess for any discrepancies or masses. There's our lovely pleural tissue. To achieve the right ventricular outflow tract or three vessel view, you will sweep from the four chamber cephalid on the fetus without changing the orientation of your probe. This is the three vessel view. From there, it is a slight movement further cephalid and a tiny twist towards the fetal spine to open up the aorta and to demonstrate the three vessel trachea view. The addition of the three vessel view to the four chamber heart for screening and heart anomalies increases the sensitivity and detection rate dramatically. The three vessel view should demonstrate an oblique line from anterior to posterior and left to right. One, two, three. Number one, the main pulmonary artery has the largest diameter, it is the most anterior, and it continues to the ductus. Number two, the ascending aorta has the middle diameter and the middle position. Number three, the superior vena cava has the smallest diameter and has the most rightward and posterior position. If there's any deviation from this arrangement or the proportions, there's need for a fetal echo. So to sum up, this view is useful in assessing course and connection of the ductal and aortic arches, arch sidedness, size and proportion, and the presence of the thymus when the sternum is anterior. We can see the hypocope structure anterior to the cardiac vessels here. The absence of this um, can flag you to think about uh, 22Q deletion. Next, the three vessel trachea view demonstrates the proper relationship of the trachea and the vessels, ruling out other anomalies. So we can see that in this view. The left ventricular outflow tract. Acquiring the left ventricular outflow tract view is done by returning to the fore chamber and twisting the probe to lengthen the LVOT, running posterior and rightward. This view is used to demonstrate that the perimembranous ventricular septum is intact and continuous with the left ventricular outflow tract. This is known as septoaortic continuity. It's useful in determining that the size of the vessel is appropriate and that the aortic valve appears normal. Crossing outflows. While the fetus remains in the same position and orientation, split the screen and document the left and right outflow tract showing that the vessels cross. The reason is proving that the vessels cross rules out such anomalies as double outlet heart, so double outlet right ventricle or double outlet left ventricle, and transposition of the great arteries, TGA. Looking at the intraventricular septum, to achieve the muscular IVS view, move back into the plane used to image the four chamber heart. Manipulate the axis by utilizing a heel or toe movement of the probe to again point the apex horizontally. Now you're insinating the muscular intraventricular septum at a perpendicular angle, and this will provide the best resolution. The reason for this image is to assess for septal defects, plain and simple. Fetal situs. To document the situs of the fetus, you must ensure that the orientation remains the same for both images. This is challenging. We know this as fetuses move. <laughs> so just be cognizant of this. Sweep in an axial plane from the level of the four chamber caudally through the thorax and into the abdomen. Acquire an image of the four chamber heart and the stomach. Annotate the presentation of the fetus. This is done to assess the situs. It is imperative that the fetal position is noted, as I've talked about already, as this is the determining factor when assessing proper orientation. From here, we're going to move on to the fetal diaphragm. 
So the fetal diaphragm can and should be assessed in both the sagittal plane and the coronal, ensuring to sweep from left to right and anterior to posterior in totality. Then acquiring indicative images depicting the stomach, diaphragm, and heart properly situated. The reason for this is proving an intact diaphragm by performing a full sweep left and right and anterior and posterior increases the ability to rule out a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. The most common occurrence is on the left side, which accounts for approximately 80% and is also known as a boctalec hernia. This type allows for the herniation of the stomach, bowel, and sometimes the liver. The right-sided type, which accounts for the other 20%, um, is also known as a Morganier hernia and often demonstrates herniation of the liver into the thorax. The diaphragm, importantly, is assessed both directly by looking at the hypoechoic line and indirectly by assessing the adjacent organ position. This image is also helpful in supporting proper situs. The image provides an opportunity to interrogate the liver parenchyma and assess the subdiaphragmatic area, paying attention for free fluid then thinking about bowel perforation, ascites, etc. Looking for calcifications, again, thinking about bowel perforation or secondary signs of infection, or any other findings that require further scrutinization. The bowel can be seen and assessed for increased echogenicity, which has some association with aneuploidy, cystic fibrosis, infection, and bowel-related complications such as an obstruction or perforation. And we also think about um, fetal growth restriction and an increased risk incidence of demise. Next, the fetal abdomen and pelvis. So the images to be included in the fetal abdomen and pelvis assessment and interrogation are the abdominal circumference, stomach, fetal cord insertion, color flow imaging demonstrating two umbilical arteries, the bladder, kidneys, transverse and sagittal or coronal, and the fetal genitalia. To achieve the abdominal circumference measurement and document the stomach, Begin in the axial plane, sweeping caudally from the four-chamber heart view until you see the stomach. This will include a cross-section of the vertebrae, the umbilical vein at the curvature, which is formed by the umbilical portion of the left portal vein, and a rounded abdomen. Be careful not to angle inferiorly at the anterior aspect and connect the umbilical vein with the fetal cord insertion. Likewise, take care not to include the retroperitoneal structures, such as the kidneys, this will signal to you that you have angled inferiorly at the posterior aspect. Also be aware not to include the pleural tissue as this will indicate that you are oblique with the posterior aspect of the fetal plane angled superiorly. Include the entire skin circumference to the best of your ability. Do not follow the line of the rib but rather the superficial skin surface for accuracy and standardization of measurement. The reason, this image is helpful in assessing the presence and the size of the fluid filled stomach. Absence could indicate a TE fistula or a neurological issue that limits swallowing, etc. There could be a double bubble sign, which is indicative of duodenal atresia. The liver parenchyma can also be appreciated in this view. And finally, this is an area to be aware of skin edema or the presence of ascites. This is the level where a persistent right umbilical vein could be appreciated. And a persistent right umbilical vein is associated with an increased risk for fetal cardiac abnormalities, and it would likely prompt a fetal echocardiogram. So just be aware of that. Continuing on to the fetal cord insertion. To achieve this image, sweep caudally in the axial plane from the level of the abdominal circumference. You will see the fetal cord insertion as two linear anechoic vessels. The reason, this image is used to rule out the presence of an abnormality related to the umbilical cord, such as herniation of the abdominal contents or something within the cord itself. Gastroschisis appears as free floating bowel herniated at the level of the cord insertion. An omphalocele appears as a herniation of bowel and possibly abdominal or pelvic viscera and is covered by a membrane as the contents have actually herniated into the cord. There is also an opportunity to assess the umbilical cord at this level for the presence of cord abnormalities such as cysts, occluded vessels, and a hypercoiled appearance. Finally, this image captures the pelvis in a cross section and allows for appreciation of the bowel and part of the retroperitoneum. Be on the lookout for free fluid or ascites. Here we can see an abnormal image of the fetal cord insertion, and this is demonstrating a large omphalocele seen with a case of T18. Same thing in transverse and looking with color flow imaging we can see that it's herniated into the cord itself. 
Next, we're going to look at the color flow imaging of the two umbilical arteries. This image is achieved by sweeping inferior in the axial plane from the level of the fetal cord insertion to the level of the bladder, rotating to connect back to the cord insertion with a slight oblique plane of imaging. Turn on your color flow to demonstrate the two vessels traversing the bladder on either side. The reason for this is the finding of a single umbilical artery is associated with an increased risk for fetal heart abnormality and will prompt a referral for a fetal echocardiogram. Keep in mind, without proper demonstration as outlined above, one can mistake the iliac vessels for the umbilical arteries, and caution should be taken to ensure that this is not the case. Moving into the bladder, this image is achieved in the true axial plane at the level of the iliacs, inferior to the level of the fetal cord insertion. Assessment of the bladder size and contour is important when considering obstructive pathologies, renal abnormalities, and implications of severe growth restriction, i.e. thinking about issues with fetal perfusion and organ function. The shape of the bladder can also play a role. Think of the keyhole sign, which indicates posterior urethral valves. The kidneys. We have several images here looking at coronal kidneys, sagittal kidneys, and transverse. The kidneys must be imaged in two planes, transverse and either sagittal or coronal, but whenever possible, it is ideal to image in all three planes. To achieve the transverse kidney image, you will need to scan in an axial plane with the spine up. Sweep cephalid from the level of the bladder or caudally from the level of the stomach until you reach the kidneys. Take your image as a cross section of the kidneys mid pole at the level of the renal pelvis. Label this right and left appropriately and take an image with and without measurements of the AP renal pelvis. From here, twist 90 degrees to lengthen the kidneys and demonstrate the sagittal view. Take an image with and without kidney length in the sagittal plane. Kidney length is roughly equivalent to gestational age at this stage of pregnancy, so that's another good mile marker to keep your eye on. The reason for these images um, the renal pelvis in the second trimester should measure left, less than 5 millimeters AP. Above that is considered abnormal in the second trimester, although in the third it goes up to 7 millimeters. If you see this, further interrogation to assess cortical involvement and ureter dilatation is important. Also, striving to localize in order to assess for obstruction, i.e. ureteropelvic junction, ureterovesico junction, posterior urethral valves in a male, we want to look for the size discrepancy between the kidneys or discrepancy in the level or the location. Always sweep fully, assessing for horseshoe, cross fuse ectopic, or pelvic kidney characteristics. If you're struggling to identify one or both kidneys, employ that coronal view with color flow imaging to demonstrate the renal arteries and where they lead, or if there is an absence. With the kidney views, you can also assess for any masses within or proximal to the kidneys. Think about the adrenal glands as well, which sit superiorly. Next, looking at the fetal genitalia, this image is obtained by sweeping caudally in the axial plane from the level of the bladder. The fetal legs must be separated laterally to allow for accurate visualization of the genitalia. Most errors occur due to this criteria not being met. The female genitalia appears three echogenic linear interfaces representing the labia, and the male genitalia appears as a distinct anterior protrusion of the phallus. The reason, it is possible to evaluate for abnormalities such as ambiguous genitalia or posterior urethral valves, you'll get that tulip sign, and masses, etc. It is important to have an accurate correlation for expected growth and fetal weight based on the fetal sex. It can also be incredibly important information when considering sex-linked syndromes, so X-linked or Turner's, etc., or when this would guide the differential diagnosis, i.e. there's a pelvic cyst, or we thinking ovarian. If the patient does not want to know the sex of the fetus, this is easily accommodated by simply asking them to avert their eyes or turning off the patient screen at the end of the exam so that you're able to document the anatomy. So female and male. Here's an example of an abnormality that was picked up. And this is a case of uh, microphallus. We can see that in the first image, it's very difficult to distinguish um, those three lines that you might see with the female and this microphallus. And this was present in a case of dwarfism. 
the fetal spine. The images to be included in the fetal spine assessment and interrogation are sagittal views of the spine from superior to inferior, so cervical to sacral, and the transverse spine at the level of the iliac crest. The sagittal spine. The spine must be interrogated in its entirety in both the sagittal and transverse planes. To assess in the sagittal plane, start at the inferior aspect of the fetal skull, the occiput, and twist the transducer to lengthen the line of the sagittal spine. From here, image and slide caudally on the fetus to depict the mid and distal sections of the spine. Always sweep left and right of midline spine to assess the lateral elements. The distal end must be interrogated and imaged with the fetus away from the uterine wall. And the reason, in the case of spina bifida, the secondary signs such as lemon sign, banana sign, and ventricular megaly being the most common, are more often readily observable with ultrasound, but it is still important to survey the spine for the splaying vertebrae and open neural tube defects. The spine may demonstrate other abnormalities such as kyphosis or scoliosis, which can be demonstrated in um, sagittal or coronal or hemivertebrae, etc and any defects must be localized appropriately. The sagittal imaging provides an opportunity to visualize the conus, its level, and the appearance for further characterization of any suspicious findings. The spine must be interrogated with the fetus away from the uterine wall in order to accurately prove an intact skin line, thinking about the presence of an open neural tube defect and the absence of any herniating structures through a defect. Here we can see an abnormal spine demonstrating an open neural tube defect, and we can delineate the conus as well. To observe the spine in transverse, rotate the transducer 90 degrees from the sagittal plane and sweep superiorly and inferiorly through the entire spine, cervical through coccyx. The indicative image has been standardized at the level of the iliacs, presuming that there's no findings. And the transverse sweep actually has a higher sensitivity in evaluating the individual vertebral segments as it demonstrates the vertebral pedicles of each. Look carefully for splaying of the vertebrae or asymmetry. Here we can see how the landmarks correlate. And moving on to an abnormal image of the transverse spine demonstrating splayed vertebrae and an open neural tube defect. The images to be included in the fetal limbs assessment and interrogation are left and right femurs with measurement, left and right tibia and fibula, left and right ankles, left and right feet, left and right humerus with measurement, left and right radius and ulna, left and right open hands. The lower limbs. To evaluate the femur bone, sweep slightly caudally in the axial plane from the level of the transverse spine image. Here, you will encounter the femoral head. Twist to lengthen the bone. Then, heel toe appropriately to bring the interface of the bone perpendicular to the scanning plane. Always measure the bone in the near field, as the resolution is increased and the ability to properly and accurately measure the bone also increases. Always image both the left and right. From here, you can proceed to the tibia and fibula image by moving distally in the lower limbs from the femur. It may be advantageous to sweep in the axial plane through the lower limb. This is a cross section of the tibia and fibula, side by side, and then twist to lengthen. The reason, for the femur length, a standardization of the measurement is imperative, as this is one of the data points for the biometry used to plot and track growth and expected size for, fetus, for the fetus. Discrepancies between technologists, sites, etc. can cause errors and issues in the quality of care for the patient. In practice, this means that the caliper placement follows the vertical linear edge of the ossified bone and not beyond. The femur length does not include the epiphysis of the femoral head or the lateral condyles, as these are cartilaginous structures not yet ossified. Evaluate the integrity of the bones for irregularities. Think about fractures, bowing, shortened limbs, also a marker for T21, and any other abnormalities in consideration of skeletal dysplasia, genetic disorders, or intrauterine growth restriction. 
Also, observations of typical movements and specifically joint movements is when you're thinking about neuromuscular disorders, fixed flexion extension issues, this is incredibly valuable. To finish the interrogation of the lower limbs, move into an ankle view by moving 45 degrees from the typical tibia fibula image, which is a lateral media, medial plane through the bones, and angling in instead an anterior posterior plane through the length of the calf and foot. To image the footprint of the foot, <laughs> sweep in an axial plane through the calf, tibia or fibula, inferiorly all the way through the foot. Attempt to demonstrate delineation of the phalanges, showing five digits, and the metatarsals. You can see those here. When assessing the ankle, there's a perfect opportunity to evaluate for a talipes equinovarus clubfoot, which can be either unilateral or bilateral. It is also important to note movement of the knee and ankle joint throughout the scan, thinking again about neuromuscular disorders, specifically arthrogryposis and others. And the footprint image will appear abnormal in the case of talipes and is another opportunity to assess for any amputations, as is the case with amniotic band syndrome, or any malformations. Here we have a clear example of abnormal limb situation, and um, in this case it was arthrogryposis. The upper limbs. So the humerus image acquisition is similar in approach to the femur in that it is beneficial to begin in an axial plane at the thorax and sweep cephalid from the heart to transect the humeral head. Then lengthen the bone by twisting the transducer. Always image both the left and right and label accordingly. Measure the humerus length in the near field demonstration and then move distally through the upper limb to image the radius and ulna, similarly to the tibia and fibula image. It may be desirable to sweep in a cross section of the forearm bones and then twist the transducer to lengthen them. The considerations for the measurement of the humerus are the same as for the femur bone. The measurement does not include the epiphysis or the lateral condyles and consistency of the standard is very important as previously stated. At the time of the detailed anatomical scan, the humerus length is also used for biometry. Assessment of the upper limbs for abnormalities, just as with the lower limbs, and in addition, radial ray malformation or anomaly, hypoplasia, aplasia, is very important. We think about the structure and the movement, should, and this should always be considered. The open hand images tend to be an element of the detailed anatomical scan that employ both experience and luck. There is no quick tip for these challenging images. You may have increased success if you check in periodically, and there's anecdotal evidence that a favorable spot to image the hands is when they are resting against the lateral face or head and are often open or extended. This is my anecdote, but give it a try. It is valuable to assess the number of phalanges and the ability of the fingers to extend. The presence of a thumb should also be documented and labeled. And you must always kind of have consideration for possible amputations, missing digits, clenched hands, which might signify aneuploidy or neuromuscular issues, specifically arthrogryposis, and movement is always important. Here we have an example of an abnormal fetal hand and is the result of an amniotic band syndrome. Here is an example of clenched fists, and this was present with a T18. So finally, the amniotic fluid. At this stage of pregnancy, the assessment of the amniotic fluid volume tends to be more qualitative and only quantified when there is a suspicion of an abnormality. The amniotic fluid index is not used at this gestational age. So polyhydramnios requires a deepest vertical, vertical pocket of greater than eight centimeters, and oligohydramnios requires the absence of a two by one centimeter pocket. The reason for this image Consider the possible explanations for an increased amount of amniotic fluid. Diabetes, TE fistula, neuromuscular disorder that would limit or decrease the swallowing. All of these would require further investigation and management. Consider the possible explanations for decreased fluid. Think about poor placental perfusion, as in the case of um, intrauterine growth restriction, or fetal renal dysfunction, dysgenesis or agenesis, or ruptured membranes. Are there any questions? 
Thank you so much for your time and attention, everyone. It's been it's been a real privilege to have a chance to speak at this conference. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for Kelly's, uh, and she's with us live, Kelly with her fantastic hair. Uh, she'll be providing hair tips, uh, you know, <laughs> separately, check the link. Um, so we have a couple of questions uh, and uh, I will start um, with uh, Kelly. So um, at what age does an equal fold measurement become irrelevant? Oh, thanks for that question. So typically when we're seeing these patients for their detailed anatomical scan, we are targeting around that 19 week mark. So the nuchal fold is relevant during that phase up to 22 weeks. So once the, the gestation reaches 22 weeks, the nuchal fold measurement is no longer relevant. Okay, excellent. Great. Um, next question. Um, and we do have some questions about fetal heart and we okay. will be having a special presentation um, specific to the fetal heart later on. So maybe we'll just, just do a couple of little ones here. Sure. Um, is a, a trace amount of pericardial uh, fluid uh, important? Great. Um, so noticing that physiological amount of pericardial fluid is normal. So the guidelines that we kind of work within are an AP measurement of greater than three millimeters, and importantly, throwing on M mode, transecting that pericardial fluid, and seeing if it persists through diastole, because we should see that actually go away during diastole as the ventricle fills. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I think from our perspective from the MFM side is that generally if it's under uh, five millimeters, it's it's most often physiologic, but certainly again, um, if it's between three and five, that might be, you know, something that does need uh, just, just a, a closer look. Um, and uh, next question, again, there's a couple heart ones that are great, but I, you know, great. Will probably to be discussed after, yeah. um, but maybe we'll just, uh, I'll move ahead to amniotic fluid. Now, this question is about uh, AFI versus deep, deepest pocket, and I think I can actually answer that if that's okay, in that at the time of the detailed anatomical ultrasound, so generally it's done between 18 and 22 weeks. We sort of like 19 because it's uh, sort of in between. Um, we don't actually measure an amniotic fluid index um, that uh, really is is for sort of 24 weeks plus. Um, and really now the movement is away from AFI altogether. Um, but I do think it's appropriate at the detailed ultrasound to to see what is normal amniotic fluid. And so you can do, a, if it does look um, like it's uh, reduced just to do a, you know, a vertical pocket measurement, but yeah, no AFI at the time of the detailed ultrasound. Kelly, do you agree? Absolutely, yeah. That deepest vertical pocket is more um, utilized once you've had that qualitative assessment. If it's looking like it's increased or decreased, throw that on there for reference. Perfect. Okay, should the detailed anatomy scan be done under 19 weeks? Um, it's, and the, to clarify, it says, I know that they can be, but should they be? Sure. Um, so I, I'm sure there's great voices to weigh in on this. Uh, as Steph noted, Stephanie noted, um, the towards optimized practice guidelines are from 18 to 20 weeks or 22 weeks, depending. So it can be done at 18 weeks. We like to get it in that range because we're, we're considering factors um, that are dependent on gestational age, such as ossification of the vertebral bodies when we're assessing the spine. And we're thinking about those measurements that we hold. So the nuchal fold and the data that we have on that. So I personally think that we should always have that um, detailed anatomical scan around 19 weeks, falling in that range from 18 to 22 for best results and best screening. Yeah, and so Kelly referred to the towards optimum practices. Those are our, our, our Alberta or our provincial um, obstetrical ultrasound imaging um, guidelines. Another really good reference, of course, is the uh, ISUOG. I S U O G um, has some great uh, resources as well. That's our international ultrasound um, for obstetrics and uh, gynecology, um, and we can uh, share that in the link as well. Um, you know, as a caveat to that, yeah, absolutely. You know, bang for your buck if you were to 
uh, get, you know, wanting to really look at fetal anatomy, that's that window. Um, as you get further along in pregnancy, of course, then uh, babies get bigger. Some structures are going to be difficult to see. A third trimester, babies often will keep their hands curled like this, and you'll see that with newborns. So um, there are some structures that you will not, you know, as as you get into the third trimester, will be suboptimally visualized. Um, at the same time, there are there are times when we really should be looking at the anatomy earlier. Somebody who has had, for example, um, a first trimester uh, aneuploidy assessment that's abnormal, you may want to do um, an uh, ultrasound between um, that sort of 13 or 12 to 19 weeks. And of course, we really are moving to try and get as much anatomy uh, as we can in the first trimester because, um, you know, with the technology and with the interest and passion, we can diagnose some um, anomalies uh, earlier. And that is something that we're going to be talking about a little bit later today. So, um, I, uh, I know maybe we have time for uh, just um, one or two more uh, questions. How much time should be allowed? Oh, that's a hard one for the anatomy scan. Um, so in my experience, we do see a little bit of um, difference between sites. Um, I feel very strongly that if we're going to be doing a thorough assessment and survey of the anatomy listed as outlined here, 45 minutes should be the minimum. Um, I do know, I recognize that some sites are booking 30 minutes. I also recognize that those are the ones that we see for repeat scans continuously, and we're pushing back that standard of care. So every time that we bring them back, because we haven't seen things properly or we're not allotting enough time, we're pushing back the patient's timeline as well. So um, I would say 45 minutes to an hour. An hour is ideal if you're going to be doing a thorough investigation. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point. I mean, um, uh, if you're rushing to get everything done, then you're not going to be truly assessing the structures um, with the attention to detail that is needed. Yeah. Um, and if you're rebooking the patient back, then what's happening is that think about what that means for them, um, especially if we had a pandemic. So they may have to drive to come to an ultrasound appointment that may be an hour away, for example. They have to get childcare. They have to take time off work. So, you know, I really think that we need to be really prioritizing pregnancy care. And that includes, you know, the attention and the efforts that quality obstetrical ultrasounds um, yeah. provide. So, um, so, and it's, it's true that we can't get, always get all the structures, especially the more, you know, the more things that we ask to, to be able to have documented, um, you know, the greater that time commitment may become. And that's maybe why when I mentioned about trying to think of uh, the detailed ultrasound potentially as that a 13, 14 week plus, you know, the later pregnancy ultrasound in order to sort of get structures. So, so lots moving uh, and interest in this area for sure. Everybody stay say tuned. One more thing um, just to add into there is a consideration from the sonographer perspective and the clinical team is if we're pushing up a scan with this amount of detail into a 30 minute spot, the role really changes from somebody that's um, exercising thoughtful consideration and rationale for each image to someone that's taking pictures as quickly as they can. And we're not picture takers, we're diagnostic imagers. So I think we should really lean into that role and have that be part of the detailed anatomical scan at all times. Yeah, I think that is an excellent point is that your job is not to just take pictures, right? It's not just to capture an image because it's a textbook picture or this is the images that you must acquire. You're evaluating the fetus in a systematic and um, with an attention to detail and you're documenting your assessment of the fetal anatomy. So a different perspective for sure, which I think is really sometimes missed. Um, okay, so uh, there's a question about uh, meningomyelocele. Uh, if you do see an abnormal spine with a open neural tube defect, uh, should you be measuring it or just image and demonstrate the defect? Great question. Um, so when we're identifying these uh, abnormalities in the fetal structures, the most important thing is accurate demonstration. Um, as far as measuring criteria, the most important message to take away from this, I would say, is to bring it to the attention of the radiologist and prompt referral to a maternal fetal medicine center quickly. Um, his timeline is really relevant to patient care in this instance. So those large fetal anomalies, those um, serious findings, the priority should be prompt referral. And I do think with... Uh 
you know, with open neuro tube defects is that you want that evaluation because now they're, the standard of care is moving towards uh, fetal surgery. And mm -hmm. that's done at, you know, very um, uh, dedicated uh, centers. And so there's a, a number of steps before we can get the patient to have that surgery. So yeah, for sure. Um, so describe as much as you can, um, but recognize, you know, as Kelly said, don't keep bringing the patient back, trying to get more information and delay the potential assessment and management uh, strategies. Um, so I am going to get take two more questions here. Um, there's so many great ones. Um, and, uh, you know, Kelly, you might, I might send these and you can put them in the chat box as well for anything we missed. Um, but uh, if a patient has had an IPS or cell-free DNA testing for aneuploidy, does that change anything in the routine anatomy protocol? Um, and yeah, how does that sort of change how you do things? Okay. Great question. Um, we're definitely seeing this technology become more available and uh, more of a common practice, which is fantastic. As far as our detailed anatomical screen, we're really looking at the structures and the anatomical um, presentation. So I, it wouldn't change much about your protocol. We should still be imaging all the same structures. Um, as far as risk analysis, an NIPS is going to supersede some of our markers. So as far as adjusting that risk, that would be a consideration. But when thinking about the ultrasound itself, we're going to stick to our same really detailed high level protocol and then give it to our physicians to manage appropriately. <laughs> Yeah, and so I think it's a, it's a great question too because that's the way that the technology is is move moving, and it's a much more accurate um, assessment for you know fetal uh, trisomy twenty one and thirteen eighteen. So things like um, cord plexus cysts, those really are irrelevant if you've had a normal NIPS test um, or echogenic foci of the heart, for example, again, um, irrelevant. So there are still markers that may be of clinical significance um, for other um, conditions such as ventricular megaly uh, or echogenic bowel. So, um, you know, stay tuned um, and as things update. But again, um, it's a bit of a difference in that we're less of the focus of saying, does this baby have trisomy 21? Of saying, is this baby's anatomy a normal? Are there any other structural anomalies that we see? Um, for sure. So, um, okay. So, uh, what if I get a two vessel cord in one picture and a three vessel cord in another? And that'll be our last question, just because uh, to move on to our next speaker. Sure. Um, that's an interesting question. So I think we would have to use a little bit of um, problem solving on that. So I'm not sure what that means if we're talking about at the level of the um, fetal cord insertion and seeing the bifurcation, or if we're talking about in the, the cord itself, because there are possibilities that come up where you have um, part of the cord uh, does not show the three vessels and the um, fetal insertion does. And that's, then we're thinking about a different diagnosis versus a two vessel cord that simply only has two vessels. So I would ask that if you're seeing it at the cord insertion, that you track the fetal cord and do a cross section to show whether there's two vessels or three to prove. Yeah. And I think true, truthfully, you can't have a two vessel cord and a three vessel cord. You can yeah. only have one or the other. So one of those images maybe is suboptimal. But um, excellent. Okay. Well, Kelly, thank you so much. And again, I'll send, uh, you'll be able to add to the chat some of those um, great questions that people are asking today. Mm -hmm.